uh, my name is Mark Korski, and uh, I will be talking about Vue again, which is a virtual machine I started working on uh, about two years ago. And first, I will present some core ideas. So, I wanted reliability, and uh, this I achieve uh, from the user point of view uh, by two things by using exceptions. Uh, because they make it hard for, uh, for programmers to ignore errors and do execution with invalid values. Uh, then I provide uh, user defined watchdog processes. When an exception arises in your process, uh, it pops up the stack, and when it escapes the process, uh, the watchdog kicks in, and uh, it can contain arbitrary logic, so you can log the exception. Uh, restart the process, modify the environment, and then restart the process, or just ignore it and say that, okay, I failed, and uh, do not. But you have the ability to survive the crash of a single process, and then have some entity manage it and do something sensible with uh, the crash. And then, also, I want to determine it. Uh, because, uh, oh. an indeterministic system is uh, harder to manage and harder to reason about. Uh, and I didn't want that in my VM, um, because you can get this behavior in other VMs. Uh, this I achieved by uh, making ownership of values uh, in the user programs clear and explicit. Uh, I don't use the uh, reference model. So, for example, like in JVM, everything you have is a reference. Everything in V1 is a value. You can take a pointer to a value, so you can emulate references. But what you get is values. You can pass them around, you can move them. But at all times, there is a one clear owner of the value. So, this allows me to present a clear model when the value is destroyed, when it's allocated, where is it, and this allows me to uh, provide a clear, explicit lifetime for all values. Uh, then I want to concurrency, because obviously we're going to a more and more concurrent world. Uh, and the model I chose is uh, that of many small processes that do not share, do not share memory. Um, not share uh, anything with each other and only communicate by asynchronous message pass. Then, core ideas on the VM side. I wanted isolation uh, because if my subsystems in the VM were interconnected, I would have to implement locking, I would have to implement synchronization, and not with hard performance. Uh, the performance isn't great, uh, so that's a bit of a stretch. But by isolating the subsystems, uh, I also reduce the interference uh, caused by user processes to each other. Uh, then I wanted environment parallelism because programming parallel systems is hard. Concurrency is relatively easier, so I move the parallelism to the environment. Every subsystem on the, of the VM runs uh, on its own host thread. So, uh, if you have, for example, uh, four threads with uh, schedulers and 16 user processes, uh, you can have four user processes running in parallel and you will need nothing. You just spawn them and they automatically balance. Uh, then I wanted resource tightness, and by this I mean. Uh, that the VM should control the resources it uses and do not leak. Uh, the VMs I uh, use at work is uh, Perl, sadly, Python, uh, JavaScript. They all have uh, more leaks, or at least something that I perceive as leaks. Uh, someone told me that probably. My benchmarks just uh, didn't trigger the collection uh, because they were too simple. 
and the environment just decided that it's not worth to run the collection. Uh, but I didn't like the behavior, so uh, in my VM everything is disposed of as soon as it becomes unreachable. And because I don't have uh, references and all the values, it's uh, actually easy to do. Uh, then before I uh, continue, I want to define concurrency and parallelism and how I understand that. Concurrency is uh, running in terms. So it's the illusion of running simultaneously, but you execute some part of process A, then some part of process B, then some part of process C, and then once again it comes to current for process A. Parallelism is running everything at or some things at the same time, at exactly the same time. Uh, in both cases, some things are interleaving, but only the parallel execution is uh, truly simultaneous. You can also disagree with me, but uh, this is the definition I will be using in the concept of the presentation. Concurrency in V1, uh, as presented to the user software, uh, is a shared nothing message passing model. So you, uh, you can't share anything between processes. And it's realized by running many internally sequential processes. Uh, so each process, from its own point of view, is, is sequential. It runs instruction after instruction after instruction after instruction, and there's no asynchrony. But the whole system is, is composed of many such uh, internally sequential processes and exhibits well, great degrees of concurrency if you want to use the tools they provide. And then, uh, how is the VM architecture? I have three main subsystems. A kernel, which is the point of synchronization, because there are some things that uh, but be synchronized between all these subsystems. Then there is a virtual process scheduler, which is a subsystem that runs the virtual processes, uh, the processes that I composed of uh, bytecode of the VM. And then foreign function interface scheduler, which I use to offload the code that I can schedule in the VM. Like, for example, uh, functions written in uh, C, C, all the languages that I can. <coughs> And uh, all of them are isolated, so the more cores you read, the more, the more cores you throw at the machine, uh, the more parallelism it should exploit. And uh, the number of the subsystems, the virtual schedulers and the foreign function schedulers are con configurable at startup. So uh, you can measure uh, which schedulers are more useful for your particular application and uh, configure this uh, to suit your needs. This uh, schematics for communication inside the VM. Uh, the colored lines uh, are foreign function calls, and the dotted lines are message passing. Uh, foreign function call uh, works like this. There is a process that wants to call a foreign function. So it just calls a function. It doesn't have to uh, know that the function is unscalable, unscalable by the VM. So it requests a call to the virtual process scheduler, and then the virtual process scheduler knows that the function cannot be scheduled by it. So it requests a foreign call and posts the request to the kernel. Then, when a foreign function uh, interface scheduler becomes available, it fetches the request from the kernel, this is all synchronized, so there are logs. And when it's done processing, it posts the response directly to the process, and the process continues running. And with message passing, say the middle process requests a message to be passed to another process, so it posts the request, uh, send a message to somebody. The message is passed to the virtual process scheduler, then it's passed to the kernel when it is put in the mailbox, and then when uh, the right process uh, decides to receive a message, 
it asks the kernel, or the virtual process scheduler asks the kernel on behalf of the process to fetch a message. Uh, all these things that are happening between processes and between schedulers are synchronized and are routed to the kernel. Uh, there are some actions that have to be synchronized, for example, uh, spawning port processes, because I have to allocate process ID, I have to allocate mailbox, uh, I have to write to the mailbox, uh, I have to, for example, balance load between the processes, uh, between the schedulers. So there are operations that operate on the global state of the digital machine, but I try to reduce them. Uh, virtual process scheduler uh, is the subsystem that runs the processes that are compiled uh, into bytecode of my VM. Uh, processes are preemptively scheduled to avoid the possibility of uh, a root process consuming all, this, all the CPU time. And the algorithm for scheduling is uh, pretty simple. Each process receives uh, some fixed amount of cycles and then runs until it exhausts the cycles it was assigned or executes a blocking operation. Uh, the scheduler operates in bursts, which are divided into phases. Like in the first phase, uh, the scheduler executes the processes, so the CPU time is, uh, is given uh, to the user code. And then, after that, uh, the scheduler performs some internal bookkeeping, like balancing load, uh, the, which involves detecting if it's overloaded and if it is posting processes to the internal queue to be fetched by other schedulers. Uh, the load balancing is also pretty naive uh, because every scheduler tries to manage an equal number of processes. Uh, so it's nothing fancy, but it works pretty well. Uh, also, the fact that I can spawn multiple schedulers is the very core uh, reason that I can move beyond the single threaded concurrency. Because the more schedulers I have, the more processes I can run in parallel. And the user software doesn't really see this, uh, and it's only visible from the point of view of the VM, um, but it speeds up execution of your software magically. Uh, and this is uh, possible because the communication channels between each scheduler are well defined and reduced to, to the minimum. So uh, I can just run them unsynchronized and the points where I need to log to exchange some information are really few and uh, uh, happen rarely. Uh, then message passing. Uh, it's asynchronous and it cannot fail, at least from the point of view of the sender. Uh, I see that uh, you're laughing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of silly because obviously a message sending can fail, uh, but sometimes uh, I may be unable to detect it. Mm, because, for example, when the message arrived on the remote node, and the network failed because I received the confirmation. So, what do I do? So I decided that it's not the responsibility of the VM to uh, ensure that the message will uh, arrive and just push the responsibility to the user code. If they need to ensure that the communication works, probably they can devise some protocol the message uh, is back or uh, it can be an arbitrary logic to, to verify the communication. Also sending the message is asynchronous but receiving the message is a blocking operation. Because if the mailbox is empty, um, there's nothing that VM can give to the process. Uh, so the execution is blocked for a specified timeout. And if the timeout passes and then there is still no message available, uh, the requesting person receives an exception. So it can uh, deal with the error however it wants. Uh, then the F5 scheduler, uh, which is a uh, pretty interesting thing, I think. 
it's used for the code that I'm unable to preempt. So for example, if uh, you executed a while true with an empty body, it will loop and loop and loop and loop and loop forever. Uh, and I don't have the ability to make it stop. Mm, because I don't know whether your foreign function is doing nothing and just looping. Uh, or it's just doing useful work. Uh, so uh, one, one thing, uh, the foreign calls are expensive because I have to synchronize, but the returns are pretty cheap because there's no synchronization both. Also, show here is just a simple atomic write using the uh, direct connection because uh, uh, between the scheduler and the process. So uh, that's it. The last two slides are just a summary, so they're not that important. Right. Questions? I would have one. So can you did you look at the album? Uh, yeah. So yeah. Can you Alan is the main inspiration for the okay. can you a little bit remember to characterize uh, where these influences are just for me to get my mental model? Uh, Viva is uh, newer and less featureful. <laughs> so then, basically, it's the ideas are all the same: uh, message passing, actor model, uh, reliability, processor starting. Uh, the main difference, I think, is that I designed Viva from the start to be parallel. Uh, airline got its uh, simultaneous multiprocessing capabilities after I think uh, ten years about after the inception. So I think I, this is the one thing that differentiates in the airline. Apart from that, it's incomparable. Um, any more questions? Right. Um, so I hope that um, uh, this is interesting. Thank you.